Hello everyone and welcome to MD International Studies online course. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the coagulation cascade and its associated disorders. This lesson is a part of your hematology chapter. So in this lesson, we're going to review the coagulation cascade. We're going to talk about the important factors and different components involved in this cascade. We're going to talk about the different tests that we use in the laboratory to evaluate the function of the coagulation cascade and also the function of the platelets. We're going to talk about the coagulation cascades disorder and we're going to discuss and review again the different patterns of bleeding associated with bleeding disorders when we're comparing abnormalities of platelets or abnormalities of the coagulation cascade. Now we're going to dive in more specifically into bleeding disorders that are caused from coagulation cascade abnormalities and we're going to separate them into inherited and acquired etiologies. So what is the coagulation cascade itself? Well, we've already talked about the development of primary platelet plug, which has more to do with the actual platelets. That coagulation cascade is more used for secondary hemostasis and basically stabilizing the primary platelet derived clot. So the coagulation cascade itself involves a system of interacting proteins. And most of these are proteases that upon activation cause an activation of the following factor in the cascade. Now, the result of this cascade is the formation of a fibrin mesh, a cross-linked fibrin mesh. Now, this mesh would stabilize the primary clot and this stabilization in the endpoint would lead to the formation of the secondary clot or hem secondary hemostasis. Now, the activation of the coagulation cascade can be separated into two pathways. We have the intrinsic and the extrinsic. Now, both of them are going to meet at a common point and continue on basically the same. Now, the merging point and the continuation is often called the common pathway. Now, the coagulation system itself um, which is also comprised of the platelets, has to be in a constant balance to avoid hypercoagulative state leading to inappropriate or non-specific formation of a thrombi. And it has to be ready to coagulate in case of extravasation, in case of certain injuries. And so there is a constant balance between pro-coagulation and anticoagulation, and these factors in the end are going to balance this system to reach a certain hemostasis. Now here we see the actual coagulation cascade. Now as you can see already in the picture, you have the separation to the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. Now, both of these are going to merge at this point and continue on via the common pathway. Now, the merging point, as you can see here, is done by factor 10. Now, let's start reviewing the differences between the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, their factors that they hold, and the endpoint of the common pathway as well. So, if we start at the intrinsic pathway, you can see that we have factor 12 at the beginning. Now, a small letter, the A, denotes that this factor is activated. So, activated factor 12 is going to activate factor 11. Factor 11 is going to activate factor 9 and activated factor 9 is going to activate factor 10. 
and now we are already starting at the common pathway. So let's take a look at the extrinsic pathway, which would lead to the same endpoint. In the extrinsic pathway, we can see that tissue factor would cause the activation of factor 7. Now, activated factor 7 is going to activate factor 10. Now, as you can see, now we've basically reached the common pathway. From activated factor 10, we see that prothrombin would become activated and would become thrombin. Now, thrombin is factor 2. You're going to see in just a moment. We're going to discuss actually every of these factors, where they produced, their functions, etc. But the endpoint is the activation of thrombin by factor 10, activated factor 10. Now, thrombin itself is going to form fibrin from its precursors, fibrinogen. Now, once we have fibrin, the cross-linking of it to cause this fibrin mesh is going to be helped by factor 13. So let's go over the different factors, the important ones in the coagulation cascade. So we start with factor 1, which is actually fibrin. Now, fibrin is the building block of the secondary clot. It forms the fibrin mesh, and it is created from fibrinogen by the action of thrombin. Now, thrombin, as you're going to see in a moment, is just activated factor 2. So, factor 2, or prothrombin, becomes thrombin when it is activated by activated factor 10. And as we've just said a moment ago, activated thrombin is going to create fibrin from fibrinogen. Now, you see that factor 2 or prothrombin, amongst other factors in this list, are highlighted in red. Now, this denotes that these factors are vitamin K dependent. Now, we're going to talk about exactly what that means in a bit, but you do need to remember which factors of the coagulation cascade are made or depend on the activity of vitamin K. So here you can only already see three of them. So remember factor 2, factor 7, and factor 9 are vitamin K dependent, and we're also going to see factor 10 and protein CNS also as dependent factors on the action of vitamin K. So, let's continue with factor 5. Now, factor 5, we haven't seen it so far in the cascade, but we're going to explain where it fits in just a moment. Now, factor 5, when it is activated by thrombin, it actually potentiates the function of factor 10, which would lead to the formation of additional activated thrombin. So basically, we have a positive feedback loop. If you see in the picture again, we can say that thrombin itself, or activated factor 2, is going to activate factor 5 and factor 5 is going to potentiate the action of activated factor 10 leading to more formation of activated factor 2 or thrombin. So we basically have a positive feedback loop. This is caused because when we have the activation of the coagulation cascade, we basically want to create locally as much activated thrombin to form the clot itself. So this is done in part by the positive feedback loop which is made by factor 5 and factor 8 which we'll talk about in a minute. 
So let us talk about factor seven. Now factor seven, you saw it as the initiation point of the extrinsic pathway. Now, something that might help you remember the different factors that are either associated with the extrinsic or intrinsic pathway is to remember that the extrinsic pathway contains small valued factors and factor seven in that specific example. You're gonna see that the intrinsic pathway holds many more factors with a higher associated number. Now let's move on to factor eight. Now we've all already briefly mentioned its purpose, but factor eight, when it is activated by activated thrombin or activated factor two, this activated factor eight is going to increase the activation of factor 10. Now, this means that we have another positive feedback loop, but now not working on activated factor 10, but inducing the activation and the formation of more active factor 10, which would lead at the end point to uh, increased production of activated thrombin or factor 2. Now, both of these, both factor 5 and activated factor 8, are deactivated by protein C. Now, we're going to talk about this protein in just a moment, but just so you remember that we also have this counter-regulatory process because we're talking about a positive feedback loop, and if unchecked could lead to inappropriately increased clot formation, then protein C has the role of deactivating these activated factors. Now, another important point about factor 8 is that it is protected from degradation by von Willebrand's factor. And this is a very important point since it usually comes up, and this relates to von Willebrand's factor disease as well as hemophilia A, which we'll discuss further on in this lesson. So let's look again at our graph and see how factor 8 functions. So we said that factor 5 potentiates the action of activated factor 10, but factor 8, when it is activated by thrombin, is going to create or to induce the formation of active factor 10. Now again, this is at the end point going to lead to increased production of activated factor 2 or thrombin. And as we said, both of these factors are deactivated by protein C. Okay, let's move on to factor 9. Now, as you can see, factor 9 is also highlighted in red, and so it is dependent on the action of vitamin K. Now, as we said before, when it is activated, it causes the activation of factor 10, leading to the formation of activated factor 10, which will continue on to produce activated factor 2. Factor 10 itself, another factor that is dependent on the action of vitamin K, and as you saw before in the pathway, is actually the merging point between the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, and the beginning point of the common pathway. And as we said before, its function when activated is to turn factor two from prothrombin into the activated form of thrombin. Now, factor 12, as we've said before, is the initiating point of the intrinsic pathway. And again, as it is highlighted in red, it is also vitamin K dependent. Now, factor 13, as we said before, is responsible to help for the interlinking of fibrin to create the fibrin polymers and the actual proteinaceous mesh. Now, proteins C and S have the exact opposite function as most of the factors we've just talked about. 
Protein CNS actually have a net anticoagulant effect. As you remember a moment ago, we said that they are responsible for the inactivation of factor 5 and 8. And they are most useful for the regulation of the coagulation cascade. We need some counteracting mechanism that would avoid an hyperactivation of the coagulation cascade when it is not needed. Now, another very important point about this is that out of the factors, except for factor 7, they actually have the shortest half-lives. Now, this means that when we block the function of vitamin K, one of the first factors that are going to be inactivated by this because there would be no more available vitamin K would be protein C. Now, because it is deactivated before the other factors will be deactivated, which are procoagulation, the initiation of treatment with vitamin K inhibiting drugs would lead to a transient hypercoagulability in the beginning of treatment. Now, this is a very important point, and we're going to talk about it further on, but try to remember that treatment with warfarin, for example, is associated in the beginning by a hypercoagulable state. And this is caused because protein C is also dependent on vitamin K and because its inactivation would occur much sooner than the rest of the factors and because it has an anticoagulant effect, the net effect in the end would be hypercoagulable state. And so we can often see transient hypercoagulable state, which more often than not is associated with tissue and skin necrosis. Now, plasmin is again works against the coagulation cascade and plasmin actually breaks down the fibrin mesh itself. Now, plasmin is formed from plasminogen by the activation of TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. Now, let's talk about some of the laboratory tests that we use to evaluate the coagulation cascade as well as the platelets function. Now, our first test is PT or prothrombin time. Now, what is important for you to remember is that it is testing the extrinsic pathway as well as the common pathway. And it is elevated or is used to monitor patients who are taking warfarin or any other severe liver disorder. So it is very important to associate the PT with the extrinsic pathway especially. So remember, in the extrinsic pathway, we can use the PT to evaluate its function, and it is mostly used to evaluate the response to warfarin. Now let's talk about the different laboratory tests that we use to evaluate the coagulation cascade, as well as the platelet function. Now the first test we'll talk about is called PT, or prothrombin time. Now, what is most important for you to remember out of this is that it is used to evaluate mostly the function of the extrinsic pathway as well as the common pathways. And this is why any pathologies that would affect factors from the common pathway and factors from the extrinsic pathway will affect the PT time or the portal mean time. Now, if you remember, as we said before, one of the factors that is associated with the extrinsic pathway, which is factor number seven, is one of the factors that is vitamin K dependent. And so PT is very useful to monitor patients who have been receiving anticoagulants which block the action of vitamin K. For example, warfarin. And so the PT is very useful in following patients 
who are receiving warfarin as a treatment, or it can also be used to evaluate any severe liver disorder that is associated with less activity of vitamin K. Now, PT itself was formed into a ratio, which is called the INR, the International Normalized Ratio. Now, what this ratio does is takes the PT result from the patient itself and divides it by the general population, the normal or the average PT value from the population itself. Now, the normal value in a normally healthy individual should lie within 0.8 to 1.2. This is because the PT result of this patient would be very similar to the average PT of the population. Now, patients on warfarin are often kept at the INR range of between 2 to 3, but the specific situation may change and different INR goals may be set. But we can basically say that when a patient is between INR of 2 to 3, that the anticoagulation done by INR is working and we basically are at the right dose. If we're outside of this range, it either way could be above 3 or below 2, we can say that we need to do some dose adjustments of warfarin. So again, it is very important to associate PT with the extrinsic pathway. Okay? So warfarin, remember, affects factor 7 and it can be evaluated by PT or INR. Now, our next very important test is APTT, or Activated Partial Thromboplastin Time. Now, as we said before, PT tests mostly the extrinsic pathway, while well, APTT tests the intrinsic pathway and, and as well common pathway. And so any pathology that would affect factors within the intrinsic pathway is going to cause increased APTT time. And for this reason, for example, we say that the hemophilias, for example, affecting, just as an example, factor 9, if we have hemophilia B, and this would be associated with elevated APTT. Another point to remember about APTT is, as we said, that INR is used for monitoring warfarin effect, while APTT is used for heparin effect. Now, another test that we can use is a mixing plasma study. Now, this is used when we want to differentiate between a factor deficiency or the presence of some antibodies that may inactivate different coagulation factors. Now, what we will basically do is mix the patient's plasma with the control plasma and retest the APDT. Now, if it improves, it means that we had a factor deficiency because when we mixed the patient's plasma with the control plasma, the APTT improved. But if the APTT does not improve, then most commonly we have an antibody which is inhibiting a certain factor. Now, these antibodies would also inhibit the factor which is found within the control plasma. And this is why APTT won't be improved. Now, bleeding time is mostly used to evaluate the platelet dysfunction and we won't generally have increased bleeding time in pathologies that affect the coagulation cascade while not affecting platelets themselves. And we can also see it when we have a pathology that affects both the platelet function and the coagulation cascade that we have both elevated bleeding time and some abnormal test which tests the coagulation cascade with the test that we've just spoken about.
just as an example, Wolf Wilbrand's disease is associated with both a platelet dysfunction and abnormalities in the coagulation cascade. Now, D dimers are actually degradation products of fibrin. And as we said before, you remember that plasmin is going to be used to break down the fibrin mesh, and D dimers are going to be formed in that process. Now, the D dimers test is a non specific test, but it is highly sensitive to any occurrence of increased thrombotic event within the body and as a result increase degradation of the thrombi. So it is used in screening tests when we have high suspicion of a clot formation, for example in DBT, in a disseminated intravascular coagulation, etc. Now fibrinogen itself can also be measured and it can give us an appreciation about the consumption in some pathologies such as DIC when we have elevated consumption of both fractals and platelets, this in the end would lead to low fibrinogen level. Now we've only already discussed the different patterns of bleeding in the previous lesson, so I'm just going to repeat it briefly, but you can expect a different bleeding pattern whether or not you're talking about the coagulation cascade or a disorder associated with platelets. So in this lesson, we're gonna focus more on abnormalities that affect the coagulation cascade. So abnormalities of the coagulation cascade are gonna be associated with deep tissue bleeding, bleeding into joint spaces, which would cause hematrosis, and in the end can lead to arthropathy and even deformity. We can see spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage as an abnormality of coagulation. And when we talk about platelet deficiency or dysfunction, we're gonna see skin bleeding, we're gonna see petechial rash or echimosis, and mucocotaneal bleeding as well. We're gonna see epistaxis, genitary urinary system, gastrointestinal tract bleeding, etc. So let us talk about the different coagulation cascade abnormalities. Now we can separate them into congenital abnormalities or acquired. In congenital, we're gonna discuss hemophilia as well as von Wilbrandt's disease, which as we've mentioned before, is a mixed disorder of both platelet dysfunction and coagulation cascade abnormality. Now we also have acquired bleeding disorders and most commonly these affect vitamin K related disorders. For example, inactivation by drugs, we've already mentioned warfarin as a drug that can cause this. Also liver disease. We can have different antibodies that inactivate certain clotting factors. And as we've mentioned, we can help differentiate it from a normal deficiency when we do the plasma mixing study. And we also have consumption coagulopathy which most often relates to disseminated intravascular coagulation, which we've talked about in the previous lesson as well, where we have both consumption of platelets and coagulation factors leading to abnormality in both of these areas. Now let's start talking about the different disorders causing bleeding. Now the first one we'll talk about is hemophilia. Now, hemophilias are a group of inherited disorders of the coagulation pathway, and thus they result in a bleeding disorder that is consistent with coagulation abnormality. Now, these disorders are caused by a deficiency of a specific factor. Now, the main types that you should familiarize yourself with are hemophilia A, and it is the most important one to remember. It is X-linked dominant. It is the most common form of hemophilia and it's caused by the deficiency of clotting factor eight. Now, hemophilia B is also X-linked dominant and is caused by deficiency of clotting factor nine. Hemophilia C has an autosomal inheritance. It is very rare. It is not commonly used in the exam and it's mostly seen in Ashkenazi Jews.
Now, the common features of hemophilia are, as we said before, a bleeding that is consistent with coagulation pathway disorder. So you can expect deep tissue bleeding, hematomas, etc., etc. Now, the important lab tests, which we've already mentioned before, are that bleeding time would be normal. As we said, it is mostly associated with platelet function. Fibrinogen won't be consumed or anything, so we have a normal value. Thrombin time would be normal. PT is often also normal. And APTT, which if you remember involves more the intrinsic pathway, is going to be elevated. Now, again, we can do a mixing study to distinguish between a deficiency and actually a specific immunoglobulin that inhibits these factors. Now, the therapy may involve either using a sort of preparation that has the missing factor, such as cryoprecipitate or fresh frozen plasma, for example. Now, desmopressin, and we've already mentioned that in the previous lesson as well, is going to cause the release from the endothelium of von Willebrand's factor. And one of the functions of von Willebrand's factor is to protect factor A. Now, and this is why it is useful in patients with hemophilia A and can actually, if it is a mild disorder, elevate the amounts of available factor A. Now, let's discuss different vitamin K related disorders. Now, we've already mentioned that if you done the lesson about vitamins, but anyway, vitamin K is normally found within green leaf vegetables, uh, for example, spinach, kale, broccoli, etc. It can be synthesized within the bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. And this is why that neonates have a relatively increased risk of bleeding due to vitamin K deficiency because their gastrointestinal tract is still relatively sterile and they do not produce vitamin K. Now, this is called hemorrhagic disease of neonates. And another reason for it is that the breast milk does not contain high levels of vitamin K. Now, the function of vitamin K is that it is used as a cofactor for gamma carboxylation of certain coagulation factors. Most importantly, and this list you do need to remember for your exam because this is a very common question that somehow would involve knowing which of the factors are vitamin K dependent. Well, the ones that are vitamin K dependent are factor 2, 7, 9, 10, and proteins C and S. Now, a deficiency in vitamin K would cause bleeding disorder with a coagulopathy pattern of bleeding. Now, the etiologies that are associated with it, we already mentioned hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. We can see that in right set and right poisons, they actually are vitamin K inhibitors. We can see it in iatrogenic causes, such as treatment with warfarin, liver failure, severe malnutritional malabsorption can also lead to vitamin K deficiency. Prolonged use of antibiotics, because we said one of the areas that we receive vitamin K from is from the production in gastrointestinal tract bacteria. Now, because these factors are synthesized by the liver, in, st in case of liver cirrhosis or severe hepatic failure, administering vitamin K won't be very useful in the treatment since we need a functional liver for the activity of vitamin K. And in that instance, we actually would prefer the use of fresh frozen plasma. Now, the deficiency in vitamin K or its inhibition would lead to elevated APTT as well as PT. But what is mostly used in the treatment with warfarin, for example, is the following of PT or INR. Now, our next disease is von Willebrand's disease. Now, it is 
autosomal dominant inherited, and it is the most common inherited bleeding disorder that is caused by a deficiency um, of von Willebrand's factor. Now, the deficiency leads to a bleeding disorder that is combined with both thrombocytopathy patterns, so you can expect uh, petechial rash, epistaxis, etc., etc., and abnormality of the coagulation cascade, so you can notice deep tissue bleeding, hemorrhosis, etc., etc. Now, the function of von Willebrand's factor is going to reveal why it can affect both of these pathways is because von Willebrand's factor, and if you remember from the platelet lesson, it is required for the activation and adhesion of platelets using the receptor GP1B, which interacts with von Willebrand's factor, and von Willebrand's factor is going to interact with exposed collagen in the subendotelial area. Now, another function of von Willebrand's factor is that it protects factor 8, and this is how it affects the coagulation pathway. Now, the common features is, as we said, can be bleeding disorder with both patterns of platelet, platelet dysfunction and clotting factor deficiency. And the bleeding time is going to reveal just that. So we're going to have increased bleeding time. But because we're talking about thrombocytopathy, the platelet number is going to be normal. Fibrinogen won't be affected, neither would PT. And APTT is usually the one that would be elevated in this disorder. Now, risocetin cofactor activity can be used in the diagnosis, and we can also detect von Willebrand's factor antigen to evaluate the levels of available von Willebrand's factor. Now, as we said before, desmopressin can be used to increase the secretion of von Willebrand's factor from endothelial cells. So in mild bleeding, often desmopressin is given for the treatment of this disease. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is C. The factor that is not vitamin K dependent is factor 5. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is B. As we said before, von Willebrand's factor is important for the protection of factor 8. Now, please take a moment and try to solve the question. And the answer is D. According to the history, we need to suspect a coagulation disorder. And because the most common hemophilia, inherited hemophilia, is going to be hemophilia A and a deficiency in factor 8. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is C. As we said before, in patients treated with warfarin, in the beginning, because the half-life of protein C is very short, shorter than the other factors that are vitamin K dependent, and because protein C is an anticoagulant or has an anticoagulant effect, because it is lowered first before the other factors, we're basically entering a transient hypercoagulable state until the deactivation of the other factors would occur. And this is why in patients who have started with warfarin, they often get with it for a few days heparin to counteract the risk of transient hypercoagulability. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is B. Protein CNS act to inactivate factors 5 and 8. Now please take a moment and try to solve this question. 
And the answer is C. Here we see that we have a patient with a history that is consistent with a coagulopathy. We can see that the patient shows normal platelet count, normal PT, and elevated APTT, which is not improved by plasma mixing study. Now, this would make us think that there is some immunoglobulin inactivating. Now, the most likely factor to be inhibited out of these ones, and according to the tests of this patient, is inactivation of factor 8 by antibodies. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is B, von Willebrand's disease. Here we see that the pattern of bleeding is consistent with both coagulopathy and platelet inactivation or platelet disorder. Now, this is most consistent out of these options with von Willebrand's disease, which affects both the platelets and causing thrombocytopathy and the coagulation pathway by low number of factor A. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is D. The most likely result in laboratory testing of a Wilbrand's disease would be elevated bleeding time, a normal platelet count, and elevated APTT. Now, please take a moment and try to answer this question. And the answer is A. As we said before, one of the treatments used for von Willebrand's disease is using desmopressin, which would increase the release of von Willebrand's factor from endothelial cells. Now, please take a moment and try to solve this question. And the answer is A. As we said before, when we give desmopressin, we increase the levels of von Willebrand's factor release. This would cause an increased protection on factor 8. And the one that is deficient in hemophilia type A is factor 8. So thank you very much. I hope this lesson was helpful for you. Uh, try again to remember the factors that are associated with vitamin K. Try to separate the laboratory tests that would show you either a pathology in the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway. So thank you very much and have a nice day.